while since we had her on the air, and uh, it's always great to visit with her from the Pretty Reckless, Taylor Momsen. How are you, Taylor? How are you holding up? Hello. I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm all right. You are uh, quarantined in New England, correct? I am. I am. I'm in Maine. I was just uh, saying break here. I got out of New York with just in time like two days before quarantine started uh, i was coming back up here to continue rehearsing for a tour and uh, we were in new york doing photo shoots for the record and stuff and like the timing was pretty crazy <laughs> ended up ended up stuck up here which is not a bad place to be so it wasn't by design because you live in new york city so it wasn't like i'm getting out of the city before everything comes down it was just it was just good luck it was just happenstance yeah and you, I didn't realize this. You said that the roots of your band are all in that area. I always took you guys as being like, I know you're not originally from New York City, but I know you've lived in the city. But I always just, for some reason, I thought the band was all New York based. But it, you guys are all sort of New England area? It's all New England, New York. We're all kind of back and forth. Like we all kind of live in both places, depending on what we're doing. So it's, it's all kind of the same thing to us. <laughs> East Coast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is it? What has it been like for you through all this? I mean, you you are promoting a single right now, which is amazing. I mean, I texted you about it. I, I just love it. Uh, oh, Death by Rock and Roll. We're going to play it for everybody towards the end of the show. If people haven't heard it yet, it's been out a few weeks. But I mean, I assume you have a full record done. And then like a lot of artists, because of the pandemic, you're sort of in limbo as to when the right time to put it out is. So now you've got a single and you're basically doing press on a single where people haven't heard the whole record. So like, what has this been, this whole process been like for you? It's, uh, it's bizarre, man. I mean, I think, you know, there's, there's a level of anxiety anytime you release new music that you, you never really know what to expect. Um, but certainly putting out, uh, a, a song in these ridiculously unprecedented times was a bit scary and, and you know really didn't know what to what was going to happen with it and uh and honestly though the response has been so overwhelmingly positive it's it's mind-blowing like i think we i think it just went top 10 on media base like I, and it's been out for like three weeks so i don't really know what to say other than just thanks so much for the support and and all the love we've been getting it's really it's really amazing well, I think there's a couple reasons for it, personally. I think, number one, honestly, and I'm not just saying this, I think it's great. I think it kicks ass. I think it's real rock and roll, which is what we really need right now. And also, there's it, because it has such a great quality to it, let's be honest. I mean, we're in a time where anybody can put music out, and you got a lot of people pumping things out out of their bedrooms and just flooding the market. So when you come with something of such a quality that's so well-written and well-produced, it's going to jump out a little bit as being sort of like a real thing. And I think people really needed something like that. What, what was the decision like? Was it from the label side or the band side to say, now would be a good time to put this out versus holding it completely? I mean, we we talked about holding it. Uh, it was certainly a discussion that you know we had with our teams and stuff, but uh, it kind of came down to we all kind of agreed that you know what, it's rock and roll. Fuck it, like the world needs some music right now. Music saved me, you know, countless times and has gotten me through hard times. Like I can't sit on this music forever. The record's finished. You know, it's just the first single. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Let's put it out in the world, and then you know maybe it'll put a smile on someone's face. You know. So the title of the song, Death by Rock and Roll, tell me about that. Um, Death by Rock and Roll, it's it's a long story and a short story. I mean, it uh that song is a song that's basically like 10 years in the making. It was uh it was a line that Cato, our producer who passed, used to, you know Cato, but uh it's a line that he used to say all the time. It's Death by Rock and Roll, it's it's an ethic, it's a lifestyle, it's it's live your life your own way, go out your own way, freedom, don't let anyone tell you different. So it, the song really turned into kind of our battle cry for rock and roll and, and how I want to live my life um, and how I do live my life. And it's kind of, we tried to make kind of a, an anthem for rock and roll. Mm. It's, 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 so, it's so killer. Now you say the whole album is done. And <laughs> it, how long ago did you finish it? Uh, I guess we finished it in end of January. Does that sound okay. is that right? <laughs> it took I I don't know the, the recording process was quite long. It took about a year and a half to record. Um, wow. Yeah, it's, we uh, we put everything we had into this record, so it's I'm really excited for people to to hear it when it finally comes out. Which I don't have a release date for the full album yet, but uh, it's exciting to get the ball rolling, you know, and have Death of Rock and Roll the song out there at least. 
as a, well, as a teaser well, start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's a hell of a teaser, and it's people are really reacting to it. But why, why did you? Why did it take that long? Like in that year and a half, was it just? Was it a lot of time spent on songwriting? Was it? You mentioned Cato, your producer, who passed away. He was in a. It was in a motorcycle accident, right? That he passed yes. away. Yeah. So, two years. so this is the first time you've made a record without his involvement, too, right? Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, I mean, a lot of ways, this feels like our first record um, in the sense that we kind of were starting from scratch again. I mean, it was like you just said, it was the first time we'd ever made music without Cato. So we kind of had to to learn how to do this um, and do this again. And luckily, I, you know, after Cato passed, I knew one other guy. Um, his name's Jonathan Wyman, great friend great engineer, great producer. And he's a really interesting guy. He kind of, he's a producer who kind of left the rat race. He kind of went, you know, of, of commercial music. And when I don't, this isn't for me because he, and just really wanted to make stuff sound good. <laughs> um, and so he's, he's actually up in Maine and uh, called him. And, and when I finally had some songs that we wanted to start recording and he really was just amazing throughout this whole process of, cause we were still, kind of, I was, I, I was kind of a mess. I mean, we, we went real down there for a while. Um, and it took, it took making this record to pull me out of the, the kind of depression that I was in. So it, it was, it was a lot of struggles. And I, I say it feels like our first record because we really have the, the vigor and the energy of just literally everything we have is thrown into it. I mean, emotionally, mentally, physically, the, the whole shebang, like everything, everything we had down to, you know, everything was put into this album. So it's, um, in that way, it has that excitement of the first record where it's like, you don't know what to expect. It feels like the Pretty Reckless 2.0. I don't know. It's, uh, in my opinion, it's, it's the best record we've ever made. It's, it's like a whole, I don't know, you can, you can hear the evolution. Yeah, well, I can't wait to hear the whole thing because judging from the song, it's, 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 so, it's so killer. Um, you talk about the, the place you were in and how down you were. And, you know, I've been in touch with you and, and we're friends and I've, you know, I've, I saw you guys play Rocklahoma shortly after everything with Chris Cornell and how you were feeling when you started kind of getting back out there a little bit, at least playing live. I know what the, the impact that had on you. And then, of course, losing your producer, Cato, in that accident. I mean, it just just really, really difficult stuff. So what was the process like for you to recover from all that? I know for I know immediately after... Chris Cornell passed away. You just basically shut down. You just basically, you even canceled the yeah. tour because of it. Right. Yeah. I bailed. I, uh, that devastated me. I mean, I, I, yeah, it, it devastated me as, as the, the first only word that comes to mind. And I wasn't in a good place to be public. I, I was kind of a mess and I, so I, I canceled touring. I went, you know what, this is not, this is not, I can't get on stage every night and feign, happiness and excitement that I'm here when I'm, I'm kind of, I'm falling apart inside. So we canceled. I went home to try to process what had happened and, and take some time. And I actually started writing and, uh, we were actually talking about, you know, with Kata, we were, we were talking about booking a studio and going into make a new record. And then bam, um, got the call about Kato and that, that was kind of the, the nail in the coffin for me, I guess, in a, in a lot of ways where it was just that kind of put me over the edge. If I kind of, I kind of gave up Eddie, like I kind of just went, you know, fuck it. Like, what's the point of any of this? Like, I can't, I didn't know how to handle the grief. Um, and I went real down into, into my own emotions and my own head and the substance abuse, you know, all, all of that. that all, everything there were a lot of people really worried about you then, as you know, myself included. I <laughs> mean, I dropped you some text check, checking on you. And I know a lot of people in your inner circle did there. There were really people very concerned about you at that time. It sounds like deservedly so. Yeah. And it was really, I mean, I have, I'm very thankful that I have such a great support group, but uh, it, it really, no, it was bad there for a minute. And, and to make a long story short, it was, uh, it was music because I didn't really know what to do anymore. So I, I turned to music, started just by listening to records that I love and, and trying to just get through each day. And, uh, and that kind of turned into writing, which I didn't really try to write this record. It kind of just poured out of me. And once that kind of started, then it was like, okay, I have, I have a start of an, I have enough material here that we need to start recording. And that led to the whole other process of how, how the hell do we go about doing this now? Um, which led us to Jonathan Wyman, but, uh, it was, uh, it was 
it's a long, it's a long road, it's a long process. And, and I don't think, it, you know, it's grief and stuff like that. It's, it's not something loss, you never get over it. It's just something you learn how to live with. Um, and I think this record, all, all of that, all the culmination of all of those emotions and all that shit we went through is really reflected in this record. The interesting thing for people to know about your love of Chris Cornell and how much it impacted you and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you, you didn't actually know him personally well at all. If I'm not no. mistaken, you were just a, a huge fan and he was a big influence on you. But if I'm not mistaken, you had told me shortly after that tragedy happened that you actually met Chris the, for the first time, because you were on tour with Soundgarden opening for Soundgarden the night Chris died. But, but I, pretty sure you told me a story that he actually the first time you met him was the night that he later took his life right that he you were standing you told me some story you he came by you as you he was going off stage or something refresh my memory tell me if i'm right because i remember you telling me something like that um not the first time i'd met him but uh it was yeah but uh i mean i had spoken to him a few times on that tour we'd had a couple nice conversations um he but uh, I didn't, I certainly didn't know him well by any means. Uh, I just, I grew up idolizing and worshiping his music. Um, but yeah, I mean, that night was, it was the last show of the tour. Um, so I kind of, I stood outside to, I you know, just wanted to say thanks and, and goodbye. And it was a, a brief, sweet moment. And uh, we stayed in the parking lot, hanging out after, you know, he left and we were hanging out and waiting for the buses to leave and went to bed that night and the next morning woke up to the most tragic news ever and it and it hit me like a ton of bricks like I didn't I didn't know how to I'd never felt anything like that before yeah yeah and and that's I think that's the that's the thing I mean that speaks to how much he meant to you from a musical perspective because the oh, yeah. the grief that you have is understandable but it's coming from the place of just your love of how his music touched you more than anything, because it wasn't like you had a close personal bond with him. Like you did say with Cato, where it was, you know, a different, a different thing. He was somebody that yeah. was very much in your world. Oh yeah. That was, that was a whole, that's, I think that that's why it was so, it was so painful. I mean, not why, but one of the reasons all of this was so painful, it was such a one, two punch of like lost an idol and then lost your best friend, like bam, bam, right back to back. And it just, uh, it was something I didn't really know how to, yeah, I'd never experienced anything even remotely close to it. And I had no idea how to go about healing. Um, and it took a long time, but it's, it's music and baby steps. That's what I learned. Just one little foot in front of the other until you, you slowly, you'll end up on the other side, you know? So needless to say, I'm, I'm sure that, that some of these things that you've endured are certainly going to be manifested in this full record when we hear it, that, that it's it's probably oh, yeah. there's there's a lot in in there safe to say it, it's all in there yeah it's pre, it's pretty much as bare as it can get um did that did that process help you taylor did it help you get on the other side of it doing it through music it, i think it was the only way i could have possibly gotten through it so yeah it helped me immensely it was kind of it was it was therapy in in a lot of ways you know kind of I think I said this already, but it kind of just poured out. It wasn't something I had to try to write a song about something. It was just, it was so ingrained into who I became and who I was that there was no escaping anything. There was no trying to hide from it. So it was just, well, this is, this is the, this is the, the cards that life have dealt me right now. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I have to, you know, either, it was either give up death and give up or, you know, figure out how to move forward and music, was and I want you I, I I trusted music like I have my whole life and, and I, I turned to that again and I gotta say thank god for rock and roll I, I know it sounds so cliche but it music rock and roll saved my life like it full-on did 100 percent yeah I, I've said this many times I mean I I have I have so much respect for you on so many different levels as an artist because you you did you, you we see and have seen over the years like a lot of people who you know they're they're in they're in acting and maybe they dabble in rock and roll or whatever. I mean, your commitment to rock music, the fact that you just you you left acting and went after rock music to to mm -hmm. really 
I mean, th- th- there's nobody that could ever possibly question your love or your commitment or how and it's it's in your fiber. Do you have any desire to ever act again or are you full on into music and you don't want to go back to that world ever? I mean, I'm always full on the music. That is 100 percent. I could never, ever leave that behind. It's it's who I am as a person. I wouldn't know what to do with myself if I wasn't writing and playing music even if it wasn't for the public like even if I was just doing that for myself that's why it's the best job in the world is I'd be writing songs and playing songs in my house like I am in quarantine right now just because like for me um as far as acting I mean I was so against it for such a long time because it was such a part of my childhood um but now you know I'm an adult now I've, I've I've lived a lot of lives I wouldn't say never again just because you know life gets, life gets monotonous, you know, at times and maybe you want to switch it up. So, you know, who knows, but it's not something I'm actively pursuing or anything, but I wouldn't say like a hard no, like I used to. Do people actively pursue you to get back into it? Uh, I get calls. I get calls. Yeah. Nothing, nothing sparked my interest yet though. What do you, what about getting this record out? What would you, when would you like to put it out? Like, is it just a label decision or are you guys just going to kind of, feel the vibes out there when it might be the right time to actually put it out for everybody to hear? Yeah, we're kind of feeling out the vibes. Um, I mean, th- we want to put out a couple more songs too before the full album, like like you would in any circumstance. I want to put out a couple, like uh, introduce people to the album the way I want people to kind of get familiar with it before the whole thing is out. Um, but I don't know. I mean, we don't, it's, it's really hard to not be able to, I mean, just putting out one song, let alone a whole record to put out music and not be able to tour on it is brutal. Like it, yeah. it, it really, su- I mean, it sucks. I mean, I know there's, there's so much craziness in the world right now, but it's, it's very difficult because it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel real in a lot of ways. Cause you know, playing live is the thing that really completes that circle and to not be able to do that. You feel like it's like, you, you know, the song comes out and it's like, I'm sitting here alone, call the band, you know, you talk, you go, okay, it's out. Cool guys. It's doing great. <laughs> it's doing great. Um, what about you to get another Zoom. <laughs> yeah, about to do another Zoom, uh, what you watching, you know, like, it's, what now? So it's, uh, it's a bit bizarre. So I think, you know, hopefully we want to kind of put the record out at least closer to, when, you know, when it looks like there's going to be kind of some more light at the end of the tunnel so it's closer to when we can get back out there and actually play for real because, quarantine videos and stuff that's all good and fine but you know how many of those can you actually do before it's you know i I, we need to be in a room i want jamie smashing the drums and the guitars fucking blazing and the bass loud and i want to scream into a microphone and i want an audience in front of me you know like that's that's what's awesome and and uh it's a bummer to not be able to do that right now but you know safety first and it this is you know this is a storm like any storm it will pass so it's just we just got to be patient You know, I was thinking about it. You could almost, um, you could almost re-release "Messed Up World" right now. It would kind of, it would kind (laughs) of fit with what's going on, don't you think? You were, uh, you were a fortune teller there, Taylor. (laughs) I don't know if a fortune teller. If I don't know if the world just, I feel like every time it wouldn't be a pretty reckless record without some sort of chaos surrounding it. Um, You know, and unfortunately, I don't think the world changes that. that quick every time every time we put out a record there seems to be a song that somehow comes back around when we put out another record that's relevant again and yeah fucked up world certainly is one of them because we are living in that right now <laughs> speaking of quarantine videos and speaking of Soundgarden, you did something right did you you did something with matt cameron right we did yeah we did uh halfway there by Soundgarden. um quarantine quarantine style um is kind of a tribute for for chris uh, and I think it turned out pretty well. It was our, my first quarantine video trying to figure out all the technical aspects of things, which I've been struggling with. I, people think I'm joking when I get on these zooms and stuff and I go, this is the first time I've opened a computer in five, five years at minimum. Like I have no idea what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm constantly playing catch up with all the Instagram lives and the zooms and everything. But, uh, no, I think that turned out pretty well. And, uh, I think it was a nice, nice tribute. Great yeah, song. It was- yeah, it really was. But that's interesting what you said, though. So you're telling me that you're not a good tech person. Like most people would think, like, you're you're young. You should know all this stuff. Like, like I, I would think, like, oh, well, Taylor will, could tell me how to do this or something. But I, no, you're the opposite. You're not. I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't be able to tell you anything. I'm the worst. I literally, <laughs> I, have to call, I have to call John. I have to call the band. I have to call our Sean Kelly, our, our engineer, our tech guy. I'm calling everyone going, how do I do this? <laughs> and they're like, it's so easy. You hit the button. Like my first, I did a, my first Instagram live. I was just trying to figure out how to do it before it was all interviews and stuff. So I went on with my friend, Allie. Do you know Allie? Of course I know Allie. Yeah. She yeah, was yeah. like, I'll tell you how to do it. So we tried to do it together. Got on, kind of worked, didn't really understand it. Couldn't read the comments. They were going by too fast. I'm kind of blind. It was, I didn't really know what I was doing. We go, okay, we'll wrap it up. I, I get the hang of it, kind of. And then I couldn't figure out how to end it. <laughs> and so I'm going, so she hung up and I'm stuck on Instagram live. And I'm going, how do I hang up? Someone tell me how to hang up. And everyone just keeps typing end, 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 end. I'm like, I get it. I'm trying to end it. And I see in the corner, there's a giant button that says end. I'm like, oh, I'm stupid. Okay, thanks guys. <laughs> Till next see, time. <laughs> see, I'm I'm 55 years old. You're 20 something. You're supposed to know those things. I'm the person who's supposed to be doing what you're doing, Taylor. Yeah, I don't <laughs> spend time on computers. Like I don't like it. I don't I don't enjoy it. I like I like reality. I like playing music and I like actual conversations and all the apps and all the whatever. It just seems like a I don't know. It's I guess it passes the time. It's kind of interesting. It's but it's I like I like it in quarantine and the fact that we can still stay, you know, connected with one another. I think that's great. But you know, spending all your time on a computer just seems like a waste of life to me. Go outside. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I I agree. And the last thing before we play the song, I mean, and this ties into what we're talking about as far as doing live shows and Anybody that's seen The Pretty Reckless, just a tremendous live band. And I was just running down every day for the last few months. I've been on here running down concerts, tours, festivals that are postponed, canceled, whatever the case may be. As far as live plans for you guys, obviously, I'm sure that's all backburnered. Nothing in, on the books now, right? No, and it's a real... well. I won't say not on the books. It's just we had a great touring plan for this year. I mean, it was all the festivals, uh, it, all the all the U.S. festivals, all the Europe festivals. It was Guns and Roses with Gary Clark Jr. It was Foo Fighters. It was Pearl Jam. Like great, great touring set up. And I think what's happening is just all of that. None of it's really canceled. It's all just getting pushed. So I'm looking. I'm trying to keep the positive outlook on everything. It's like nothing's gone. Everything's just temporary it's just paused it's paused and when i and i i think that when live music comes back people are going to be dying for it you know because when you when you take something away from someone they just want it more so when i i feel like it could come back bigger and better than ever and in a lot of in that sense you know because i've been saying i'll never complain about touring again because <laughs> i just i'm dying to go on tour and you know touring gets very tiring and you get about halfway through your year in or whatever and you're like i just want to go home Never again. I'll never take it for granted again because it's the best job in the world and I fucking miss it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not always the ov overly optimistic guy, but I agree with you. I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to come out the other side of this and it could be bigger and better than ever because people are, I mean, look, there's an economic factor too. Some people really right. going to need to recover financially before they're able to spend money on shows. But I think I, I feel even optimistic that that's going to come back soon too. I just feel like we're going to, we're going to be in a good place and we're going to kind of hopefully wash away much of 2020 and just be in a better place going forward. And maybe even like you sort of alluded to have even a more of an appreciation for the yeah. things we do. Like, you know, even what I do being out there hosting this stuff or being able to connect with these artists. I mean, all of that is something we all miss. And I think that it's something we won't certainly won't take for granted. Exactly. Couldn't have said it better. You stole the words out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I, I want to wrap up with you only because I want to play Death by Rock and Roll in its entirety. Uh, I, I, it's important people hear this because it's that good. And I've been raving about it since I first heard it. And uh, I'm so psyched to hear the rest of the record. And of course, when the album comes out and there's more to talk about, well, you know, you can come on anytime. You're always texting me like, hey, about this. It, just come on anytime. Well, just I don't know. I don't know how to, I don't know the, it's, you know, it's got to be professional or whatever. No, it I don't doesn't. Know. You, you, no, it doesn't. Must, you know me, it doesn't. Well, I know you, but then it has to go through, you know, serious has to get on. No. I don't know. <laughs> just, just text me and be, I need the hotline. I need to chime in on this and you'll be on in two seconds. Right. It's easy. I will. All right. You I always got it. have an open door. Anytime you want to come on, you know that. And, and we'll you. do, we'll do the professional bit when the full album comes out and remind Sounds everybody good. about it then too. So, Hey, Sounds I'm glad to see, 
great to talk to you. I'm glad to see you sounding and looking so well. I'm glad you're feeling better. Congrats on the song. It's killer. And uh, hit me up if you need anything. Um, Eddie, I love you, man. Thank you so much. Thanks, Taylor. You too. Take care, all right? All right, you too. Stay safe. Bye-bye. We'll you too.